Was marrying little girls the norm in Semitic cultures? If so, defenders of Islam are forced to use moral relativism to defend the actions of Muhammad. Today we're going to talk about this particular issue, was pedophilia in the 7th century an acceptable behavior? David? All right, and uh, just so everyone understands what we're talking about here, a pedophile, according to the DSM-5, so the, the standard work in diagnosing mental illnesses, is someone who is over the age of 16 who's attracted to a prepubescent boy or prepubescent girl. And Muhammad was definitely uh, engaged in sexual activities with a prepubescent girl. And I'll just read one passage from Sahih al-Bukhari. We, we've covered uh, numerous passages uh, in this series, but Sahih al-Bukhari, number 6130, narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the prophet would call them to join and play with me. The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. So the reason Aisha was allowed to continue playing with dolls in the presence of Muhammad, when images were forbidden according to Islam and you weren't allowed to play with dolls, was that this rule wasn't applied to prepubescent girls. They hadn't reached the age of moral accountability and therefore they were allowed to uh, play with dolls. So Muhammad is, according to our modern understanding of the term, a pedophile. He's what we would call a pedophile. But Muslims very often say that, well, since it was a different culture, that we shouldn't judge. And let me give you uh, two quotations from Muslims who are trying to defend Muhammad by appealing to what we would call moral relativism. So this quotation is from Maksud Jafri. He says, the Arabs practiced polygamy. In the wake of custom, the prophet Muhammad married some ladies. Hazrat Khadija was 15 years older than him at the time of marriage. Most of them were his age sake. In his 50s, he married Hazrat Aisha, the daughter of Hazrat Abu Bakr, when she was just bloomed to youth. Hinting this marriage, some of the Orientalists charge Muhammad, charge Prophet Muhammad as a pedophile. It was not only the Prophet Muhammad who had married a young girl, but even the father of Hazrat Aisha, Hazrat Abu Bakr, had also married a young girl in his 60s. It was part of the prevalent Arab culture and custom, hence not to be taken seriously. So the defense here is, hey, even Abu Bakr married a young girl. It was common, and therefore we can't take this seriously as an objection to the perfect morality of Muhammad. Uh, one more quotation. This one's from Abdur Rahman Squires, and who actually believes that she'd reached puberty, even though she hadn't. He says, the large majority of Islamic jurists say that the earliest time which a marriage can be consummated is at the onset of sexual maturity, meaning puberty. Got a problem because even the Quran contradicts that. And <laughs> most Muslim scholars over the centuries haven't agreed with that. Uh, but he says, since this was the norm in all Semitic cultures, and it still is the norm of many cultures today, it is certainly not something that Islam invented. So he's saying it's just normal back then, so who are we to complain that Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent girl? How should we be able to judge him when he lived in a different time with you know, different rules? Shame on us for saying that he was wrong and immoral. And I have to say, <laughs> the reason I find this so amazing is that Muslims are actually appear appealing to moral relativism or cultural relativism here, which is right. that morality changes from culture to culture right. and from time to time. What does that say about Allah and his morality? Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing because, because I, mean, it's, I mean, it seems that, I mean, that Muslims are normally completely against moral relativism. I mean, notice, I mean, everything they condemn other cultures for, 
uh, you know, drinking or sexual immorality or something like that. According to this, we should be able to just respond, hey, it's a different culture, man. Who are you to judge? Mm -hmm. But they don't apply that. I mean, you're, you're, the, for Muslims who take Islam very seriously, they want to imitate Muhammad right down to the smallest detail, including how he went to the bathroom, right? So he is the standard. We are all supposed to imitate this standard. And even though this was 14 centuries ago in a completely different part of the world, a completely different culture, completely different ways of doing things, they still insist, but this is the way we have to do things now. So this is not cultural relativism or moral relativism. Uh, but suddenly, when Muhammad is criticized, well, it was a different time and a different culture. We should all just ignore that. And notice, by the way, that Muslims will praise Muhammad and praise Islam when they're talking about practices that Islam abolished. For instance, they'll claim that it was a common practice to kill baby daughters that you didn't want to take care of. So female infanticide. And they'll say, you see, this was a common practice, but Muhammad came and he abolished that evil practice. Well, wait a minute. If it was a common practice and morality is just relative to your culture, then how can you condemn that culture for something that was common then, right? But notice what how Muslims defend Muhammad. Hey, it was common to have sex with prepubescent girls, right. and therefore you can't condemn the practice. But it... I'm confused because I always was thought that Islam came to fix many problems in the culture, mm -hmm. like infanticides, for instance. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me Islam came to go along with things like this that are even worse than infanticides? At least, at least the, the, the baby girl is, is dead, you know, she's not suffering at the hand of a, a, a pedophile. Yet somehow Islam is okay with certain things? Yeah, and that, that's, that's definitely what it sounds like they're saying. That Muhammad came to make these societies and cultures better. He came to fix the problems. But notice the assumption here. The assumption is that sex with prepubescent girls isn't a real problem. It only seems like a problem to us because we're in a different time. But it's not a, it's not a real problem like drinking or something like that. It's not a real problem. When So what we can point out here is the idea that this isn't a problem is itself a problem because Muslims today are forced, Muslims today are forced into saying that it's not really wrong. It's just our opinion that it's wrong because we live in a different time. What, what are they actually saying? They're saying that it's not really wrong to have sex with a prepubescent little girl even though we know there are all sorts of medical problems and so on that are associated with this, that, that having sex with a little girl endangers her, it endangers any future baby she might have. Um, it's very dangerous, uh, highly immoral, but they're stuck concluding that it's okay depending on your time right. and culture. And it's just, it's just complete, complete inconsistency and hypocrisy to be the people who most frequently are judging everyone else in everyone else's culture. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. That's a wrong. That's a wrong. That's a wrong. That's a wrong. And then suddenly we get to an issue, which is really, really bad. Sex with prepubescent girls, pedophilia, something that we should all agree on. And yeah. suddenly, hey, who are, you, who are you to judge? You can't judge another person's culture or morality. Very strange religion. Yeah, David, uh, how many times have you heard, uh, or we all have heard, that Islam came to elevate the status of a woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So what did they do? Um, allow uh, pedophilia. Um, uh, basically ban adoption. How did he ban adoption? Lusting after the wife of his adopted son. Mm -hmm. Is that elevating the status of woman? Nope. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then if you if they complain about it, you smack and beat them into submission. Yeah. That's a whole different story. You smack them right up to their elevated status. Well, folks, um, while we try to recover from this episode, uh, hopefully you've been enjoying uh, everything that we presented to you. As I stated before, the goal is for you to hopefully become more aware of these kind of teachings. If you're a Muslim, I am hoping that uh, you are really stirred up right now to go and take a look at these evidence and resources that we provided for you or given you the hadith number, the source, and so on and so forth. But our hope is that you will make uh, um, a basically a, uh, an amazing decision in your life, but not only leaving Islam, but coming to Christ 
who have truly elevated the status of women, human beings, and reconciled us to God. With that in mind, uh, I encourage all of you, of course, to share these with your friends and uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel and also to David's channel, Act 17 Apologetics. Until next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.